Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, November 14th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, liberal America is still shell-shocked over the Donald Trump presidency, and they take their triggered emotions to the streets in nationwide protest. Can he racist? How is he racist? How? Yeah. Can Trump? Who's streets? Who's streets? Meanwhile, Barack Obama remains silent and does nothing to stop the Great Divide. Then, President-elect Donald Trump talks to Vladimir Putin as the two world superpowers now look forward to a peaceful and enduring relationship. Plus, say goodbye to Barack Obama's executive orders. Our new president promises to repeal nearly every single one of them, starting day one. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. We'll spend nearly a week after the election and the establishment, the left, the Democrats, still can't come to grips with reality. As The Hill points out, Shell-shocked Democrats mull a path forward. Really, the Democrats are in total disarray. This is what you need to understand. There are new alliances and new paradigms that are going to be coming out of this election. As they point out, the Democrats uh, failed to pick up much in terms of congressional races. They said they got about a half dozen seats, but they were hoping, uh, without reason, to get double-digit gains. They said the results led to plenty of finger-pointing. As to why the party's message failed to resonate more broadly, particularly with working class white voters who propelled Donald Trump into the White House. Do you think it might have had something to do with the fact that both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were saying to people like in the coal industry, we're going to bankrupt you. We're going to take away coal mining jobs. I mean, that's the arrogance of these people to think that you're going to come into this place, that you're going to take people's freedom. You're going to take their dignity. By shutting down their jobs, by exporting their jobs, by importing workers, that is the essence of this. It was the Democrats who said, after all, it was James Carville, the advisor to Bill Clinton, that said, it's the economy, stupid. And it was stupid of them not to realize that it was the economy that they have been working very hard at shutting down for the last eight years in everybody's face. They pointed out, as one uh, analyst said, a Democrat from New Jersey, we fail to understand that white men... Basically, labor people, working people, have to be a part of our universe. See, that's the racism of the Democrat Party. And it's, I think it's interesting that they would say white men are working people. Look, there are working people of every race and color. There's working people who are black, who are Hispanic. They were also voting for Donald Trump because they looked at what the Democrats have done, and they said, things are not getting better for us. They're getting worse. Even the Hispanic people who have come in and become American citizens who wanted to be a part of this system, who came in and did this legally, they don't want to see the borders being overrun by drug cartels, by terrorists, by cheap labor that is coming in at an unrestricted rate. They said they have to be a part of our universe. And we, if we don't make them part of our universe, we're going to continue to have a difficult time. Exactly. See, as the article goes on to say, the Democrats have long stressed diversity. No, what they've been distre- uh, stressing is division. You have to understand that it really is division. It's something that wins elections for them. But it doesn't solve any problems. It doesn't solve our problems to divide people. We need to go back and reclaim the dream that Martin Luther King put out there. And I think this is the dream of white people who voted for Obama, who gave him a chance. And as we saw in many areas, North Carolina, where I lived there, he won in 2008. And yet people looked at that. It didn't take them long to understand this guy was nothing but a token placeholder. He was not about governing. He was not about solving problems. And so we have to stop judging people by the color of their skin or by their gender or by any of these other divisions that the Democrats put out there and start judging them by the content of their character. And Obama, as uh, Michael Smith points out, did nothing to restrain things. Uh, Say the liberals gave us Trump. Because they didn't really address the underlying problems that Americans have. This is uh, attorney Michael Smith talking to RT's Chris Hedges in an article from RT. That's precisely it. They say the attack on the free trade agreements were key, he said. The states that he won, which had gone over to Obama twice, the Rust Belt, he said, where I come from, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, they all voted for him based on his demagoguery about how he was going to bring jobs back. Well, you know what? It's not demagoguery. If you do the kind of tax cuts that he's talking about, If you give working people who are making up to $30,000 a year 
zero taxes that they have to pay. That is a huge difference in their life. That's thousands of dollars each year, a difference in a Donald Trump presidency versus a Hillary Clinton presidency. That's something people should be celebrating about. And I don't, it's a small minority of people who are rioting in the streets who don't want people to understand that. Also today, we saw Trump and Putin talking on the phone. The Hill points out Trump talks to Putin, looks forward to an enduring relationship. I, I wonder if they quoted the Rodney King <laughs> saying, can't we all just get along? Why do we have to have this division, this anger, this fighting? You know, let's just try to de-escalate things. It was called detente once upon a time, and we celebrated that. The de-escalation of tensions between the Russians and the West. And yet now it's supposed to be a virtue for Hillary Clinton and Obama to restart, to reset the Russian relationship which is really a reset of the Cold War. They point out President like Donald Trump accepted congratulations on his White House win from Vladimir Putin today. He told the Russian leader he'd look forward to a strong and enduring relationship with Russia and its people. RT says the two leaders agree that they share a common view on uniting efforts in the fight with a common enemy number one, international terrorism and extremism. But as we'll find later in this broadcast, I'm going to tell you that uh, the Obama administration, John Kerry in particular, said no, it's uh, global warming and climate change is as big a threat as ISIS. See, that's the detachment from reality. And we've got to, we're weak into this. We shouldn't expect that the Democrats are going to come back to reality that quickly. Meanwhile, there's division within the Republican Party. As I point out, there's new alliances because Donald Trump is not a creature of the GOP establishment. So there's new alliances that are being formed, and we have to watch very carefully uh, what is going to happen with this. The Hill points out Republicans face division over Obamacare repeal. What's going to happen with that? How is that going to be done? They say congressional Republicans are looking how far to go in terms of repealing and replacing Obamacare. Exactly what does that mean? It's a catchy title, but the devil is in the details. They say, of course, senators like Ted Cruz and Mike Lee are pushing for the law to be ripped out root and branch. But then you've got other what they call centrist Republicans. I would differ with that. Uh, worried about millions of people being kicked off insurance rolls if Obamacare is repealed. And they quote a couple of senators from uh, West Virginia, from Mississippi, that are very concerned about people uh, losing their health insurance. Listen, you have to understand there's no such thing as a free lunch. The way they ought to be re selling this to the American public, explaining it to the American public, is that they're going to have markets, real markets, not the phony, quote-unquote, markets that Obama set up. Those are not real markets. No, we're going to have real markets instead of mandates. We're going to have choice instead of coercion by the IRS, by an army of IRS agents. 16,000 IRS agents were added to push through Obamacare's fines and mandates on us. That is something we all ought to be celebrating. And they're all acting, I, I think it's very interesting, that they're all acting as if nobody knows what Donald Trump is proposing. He's had a health care reform plan up for over a year on his site. And if you look at it, it goes down and it sets up essentially the mechanisms for a marketplace. It gives people incentives instead of mandates and fines, okay? It offers them tax deductions instead of fines. It gives them information about health providers as well as health insurance companies. It opens up competition across state lines. All these people who are always talking about free trade. The establishment Democrats, the establishment Republicans say we need free trade. And yet they have opposed free trade within the United States on health insurance. See, only when it doesn't impact their little monopoly do they really want free trade. And so what Donald Trump is proposing is incentives. He's proposing ownership. He's proposing allowing people to have their own money first because, of course, health insurance is important. So why not allow us to spend our money on our own health care before we have to send it to Washington? If you really meant it, Obama and Hillary, that's what you would allow to happen. And that's what's in this plan, this health care reform plan that Donald Trump put out over a year ago. And yet everybody is pretending, well, you don't know where it's going to go. Just as they continually say to him, well, are you really going to build a wall now that you're president? I mean, weren't you just lying to everybody just to get elected? It's like, no, I'm really going to build a wall and I'm really going to deport People who are criminals who are in the system who came here illegally. So, again, on health care reform, we're going to have the information to make the choices. We're going to have the incentives to make the choices. We're going to have tax deductions and health care savings accounts. So we have the financial ability to make those decisions. We're also going to have information about insurance companies, competition with them, and competition with health care providers. That's really what we need. That's what we ought to be celebrating. Now, there was an interesting article that came out. It was on the Drudge Report that don't complain that the polls were wrong. 
and it had some interesting quotes in it. They said, uh, we're hearing, oh, the polls were all wrong. And yes, they were all wrong. Sorry about that. But that's the reality. You can't really escape it. They say it reveals a complete misunderstanding of what a poll is and what standard forecasts in general are supposed to do. They say many people confuse forecasts with fortune telling. A fortune teller, they say, seeks to predict the future with certainty, an endeavor that I view with suspicion. And I have to say, I view that with suspicion as well. Yet where do we hear fortune tellers hang out today? Fortune tellers hang out in the climate change world. They're predicting the future with certainty. I have to ask you, they have these models that are untested because they're untestable, because they're projecting climate out decades in the future, and there's no way to measure that. So it's an open-ended process with no feedback. They make these prognostications, accurately predicting the future, they tell us. We have no way to check that. What is the margin of error on a climate change model? They tell us that we're looking at such and such a number of degrees. If we don't do this or that, what is their margin of error? See, when they do that, and they don't give us a margin of error, you ought to take these projections of climate change with the grain of salt that you took all of these polls. And we said that coming into it. It wasn't just that we supported Donald Trump. We had seen this over and over again. We've seen it in American elections. We saw it in Brexit this summer. Even the day of the election in Brexit, as uh, Nigel Farage pointed out, they were telling everybody, hey, leave has lost by 10 points that morning. And yet, that wasn't what happened. And so... We constantly see these projections by the climate change people. And remember, I said earlier, Russia and the United States have a common enemy, ISIS. Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump are honest enough, are grown up enough to acknowledge that we have a common enemy, ISIS. They're not playing games. They're not going to play this divide and conquer game for the military establishment, this regime change where they burn countries down and shift the populations to other countries. That's the game that the globalists have been playing. That's why they're so desperate that Donald Trump not become president. Look at this ridiculous statement going back to July of 2016. John Kerry said that air conditioning was as big a threat as ISIS. Here's the hilarious way Americans are fighting back. And at that point in time, what they did was they created a petition asking the State Department to ban all air conditioning units with the State Department in their buildings, in their vehicles, because as John Kerry said, Climate change is a threat to life on Earth, okay? <laughs> they said, whereas Secretary of State Kerry has suggested air conditioners are as big a threat as ISIS, therefore, uh, government officials ought to lead by example. Cut it down at all buildings that you own or rent, including, but not limited to, embassies, consulates, office buildings, etc., and all vehicles and limousines that you guys drive. And here's a quote from John Kerry that was so ridiculous. As we were working together on the challenge of ISIS and terrorism, he said, it's hard for people to grasp it, but what we're doing, what you're doing right now is of equal importance because it has the ability to literally save life on the planet itself. He said the use of hydrofluorocarbons is unfortunately growing. They're being used in refrigerators, air conditioning, other items that are emitting an entire gigaton, gigaton of carbon dioxide equivalent pollution in the atmosphere annually. I wonder if that's kind of like the uh, gigawatts that you used to have in Back to the Future, right? You know, the interesting thing is, is that... Uh, uh, John Kerry has never installed any air conditionings, but he has installed ISIS <laughs> where they are. And they're now working on this. One of the things that happened while the election was in full swing, and we didn't talk about it much, back October 15th, we had 170 countries meet in Kigali, Rwanda, and sign an accord that said it was legally binding, although that is pure BS. That was the way it was reported by the New York Times. It said this is a legally binding accord uh, to end Freon and to end hydrofluorocarbons in the next uh, few years. And they set up three different tiers to do this. One of the things that's interesting about this is they said this was legally binding because it was an amendment to an earlier treaty that had been signed under Ronald Reagan. So three decades ago, they did a real treaty where they sat down and they had the Senate approve this agreement. And then the Obama administration comes back and amends that agreement, and they say, well, now it's legally uh, binding because it's an amendment to the treaty. No, if you amend the treaty, it's not the treaty that was ratified by the Senate anymore. That's the legal fiction in their mind, the living Constitution, these living treaties. And that's why this is not going to be allowed to stand. And I want to give you an idea of the crony capitalism that's involved here. American and Chinese companies have increased production of HFC replacement chemicals. See, that's the deal. They want to ban what's out there now so they have a new monopoly, a copyright on these new chemicals that are out there. 
And meanwhile, we can do everybody a favor by stopping unicorn farts that are going to destroy the world. They say top officials from the chemical industry were in Kigali to push for the final deal. And the deal will divide the world into three different tracks, okay? The richest countries, like the United States, are going to have to reduce their production and consumption by 2018, just a little over a year away, reducing them to 15% of the levels they were three years ago. OK, now the rest of the world, China, Brazil and all of Africa will continue to be able to increase the use of air conditioning and HFCs until 2024. And then they'll have to start reducing it a little bit. But the world's hottest countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and they should include Texas in that, <laughs> uh, will have a more lenient for, uh, schedule. They'll be able to increase their use until 2028. And then they'll have to uh, start reducing it slightly from those increased levels. Do you understand what's going on here, right? This is a U.N. plan. And if you look at air conditioning and you look at heating and you look at heat waves, you look at the people that die when that happens, even in first world countries, this is population reduction. It is crony capitalism and it is pure fiction. And let me tell you where this is going to go. Everybody is talking this weekend about Donald Trump saying, hey, yeah, I was serious when I said I'm going to fight the Paris Climate Accord. They said, well, you're not going to be able to do that because Obama has signed this agreement. And yet the reality is, is that he chose not to do a treaty. What he chose to do was to do by executive order what he called an agreement. Now, you can call this an accord. You can call it an agreement. You can call it a partnership like the TPP or the TTIP. It doesn't matter. Whenever you make an agreement, the definition of a treaty, okay, is an agreement, an arrangement, an accord, okay, made by multiple countries for a particular purpose. So calling it something other than a treaty doesn't release you from the requirement to ratify it constitutionally. But a Donald Trump can now come in by executive order and overturn that executive order. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, the same people who put their faith in illegals to win the election are now putting their faith in the faithless to win the election. <laughs> They've gone from illegals to faithless. That's how they're going to stop Donald Trump. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about faithless electors. They're hoping that the people who are going to go to the Electoral College, which is simply a formality to elect the president after the uh, public election, they're going to send electors from each of the states where the uh, candidates won, and they're going to be selected by the political party. That might tell you that the strategy isn't going to work. But I want to take a look at the Electoral College and why that is important. Because the same people who are throwing temper tantrums in the street, and of course most of these people, besides being bust in and paid by George Soros and others uh, to create uh, problems, to destroy things, uh, these are the people uh, from high school to college that throw temper tantrums in the street. You know, you have those periods of time with your kids, the terrible twos, and then you've got the tantrum periods from high school to college. And that's what we're seeing now in the uh, streets and the byways of America. But if you look at that map behind me, a lot of people have talked about that. We've seen that map so many times in so many different elections. Just a slight tweak of that map makes a difference between winning and losing. We have seen a map that was mostly red that still got Barack Obama elected the last two elections. The reason we have an electoral college, you need to understand this, goes back to the design of our country. The founders never wanted to have a pyramid structure of power. That was anathema to them. And so what they did was they set about to create division and separation of power. They did it at the federal level by creating three different branches of government that they hoped would check each other. And then if that wasn't going to be sufficient, and they knew that it wouldn't because of power always concentrates and power always corrupts, they wanted to have other centers of power. So we had the House of Representatives that was to be the voice of the people directly elected. And we had the Senate, which was going to be the voice of the states. They were going to be appointed by the state governments. Because remember, the state governments created the central government to provide for a common defense. And if you want to know how this could possibly go wrong, I've pointed out before what happened in the county that I lived in in North Carolina, where they went from having jurisdictional representation, where it was broken down. Think about it. Even the county divisions that we have in each state are for pragmatic purposes of government, as well as to essentially put a firewall on corruption, to contain corruption within individual counties. We're going to take a look at that in just a moment. Now, the elections have been uh, rigged in this, this last particular time. But take it to another level. Imagine, if you will, the United Nations 
pushing towards a global governance. And imagine that if instead of each sovereign state that created the United Nations uh, having one vote, the United States having a vote, China having a vote, India, uh, France, Canada, all the individual nations have a vote. Instead of that, imagine that they had a direct election. So that one man, one vote worldwide. What would happen? Well, we would have India and China deciding everything, wouldn't we? And we would have to depend on honest returns from China and India, wouldn't we? We don't want to have that. And we don't want to have that in the United States either. That's why we have the Electoral College. And as CNN points out, sorry, Lady Gaga, but blocking Trump in the Electoral College is mission impossible. Why? Because they're calling on these electors to defect. And we've seen that in the past. Most recently, we saw it in Minnesota, where we had somebody voted for John Edwards in 2004 for both president and vice president. They did it in private. They say nobody would confess to actually having done this. And in response, the state passed a law that required electors' votes to be cast in public. And if you were a faithless elector, then your vote, your faithless vote, would be considered to be a resignation. The vote would be vacated and you would be replaced. We've seen it also in the 1972 election. It was the middle of Watergate happening, and we had an elector who voted for the Libertarian Party. He was, an, he was a Republican. But that typically doesn't happen. As they point out, they're usually protest votes on the losing party. And so we have most likely scenario is that we would have Democrat voters who would cast a vote for Bernie Sanders rather than casting a vote for Hillary Clinton. That is what is most likely going to happen. But that's the reason that we have the Electoral College. We need to understand that as they point out that uh, in some states they can do the math and they can say, well, a, as a percentage, uh, people in a tiny state are better uh, uh, represented by the electors than somebody in a large state like New York. No, what we want to do is we want to contain that. And let me give you a reason for why that should be. We haven't really looked at many of the results except for president. In North Carolina, they still haven't decided the gubernatorial race, and it probably won't be decided until Thanksgiving. Why? Because of one county, Durham County, one of the most corrupt counties. And I can tell you that from having had a business, uh, one of my businesses in Durham County. It had early votes that were tallied in heavily Democrat Durham County. And, of course, they extended their time by 90 minutes so they could plug more votes in there. Remember, in North Carolina, all you have to do is have a name and address, and you can vote. You don't have to have a photo ID. So they can look at these rolls. They can say, hey, come on down. We've got some uh, empty slots here that you can vote. Vote early, vote often. They say one of the most tightly fought gubernatorial races in the U.S. still does not have a clear winner. Early Wednesday morning, North Carolina Attorney General Roy Cooper declared victory over the sitting governor, Pat McCrory. McCrory, however, refused to concede, saying the race was too close to call. They've done multiple recounts. Now there's a difference of about 5,000 votes in that race. Now, with less than 10,000 votes of a margin, either one of them can call for a recount. That will probably happen. And remember, Durham County, it was McCrory was winning until just before midnight when, surprise, surprise, the Durham County votes came in. And we've seen this happen with elections where they try to take a particular corrupt county Use that to flip the state, You flip that state so they can flip the Electoral College vote for a particular candidate. And this is a reminder that we must not give up on election reform. We seriously need election reform. We can do it from a perspective of the winner so that it's not going to be dismissed as sour grapes. And we need to really push on this in the coming days and months and the years ahead. We need to get Donald Trump to recognize that there are certain reforms that can be made so that we don't have a rigged system or we're going to continually be plagued with this. But even the bipartisan issues in this Durham County, we've got Democracy North Carolina, which is a liberal group. They've criticized Durham County for the election issues. The NAACP has called for an entire new election. That's the corruption that we're seeing. But I want to point out in the time that we've got remaining that there's another issue involved here, perhaps, in this governor losing his race, if he does, in fact, lose it. McCrory was an establishment Republican. And just like Tom Tillis, who later became senator, began as a uh, town commissioner in a local election, they have pushed for toll roads. Why? Because that is the face of crony capitalism within America. It's the private-public partnerships, PPP. Remember that socialists tell us that government can do no wrong, businesses can do no right. Libertarians will flip that, and they will say that uh, businesses can do no wrong, and government can do no right. When they get together in a private-public partnership, in a PPP, 
We get the worst of both government and of business. What we get is crony capitalism. And I have to say, you know, to, to paraphrase outlaw Josie Wells, uh, don't PPP down my back and tell me that it's raining, okay? This is not trickle-down economics. And this is an important point because when we look at Donald Trump's transition team, what he's done is put somebody in charge of this $1 trillion infrastructure project that is a hardcore libertarian who thinks that all of our roads ought to be toll roads. Do you really think that? No. That is a losing proposition if you want to lose elections, if you want to lose the support of the people, put toll roads everywhere that are going to be owned by foreign corporations. We've had that here in Texas. It's gone bankrupt. Nobody wants it. And according to this analysis, and I think it's a pretty good analysis, we don't have time to go through it. They say that this I-77 toll road in North Carolina cost that governor 33,000 votes. They looked at the counties that were involved there and how his uh, support eroded there in the face of this fight. And now we have Donald Trump perhaps going to do the same thing, a $1 trillion infrastructure build-out, but he would fund it using public-private partnerships. We see this happening in Texas with a high-speed rail that is running roughshod over the people between Dallas and Houston, destroying their property rights, destroying their peace and quiet, and also sucking up government money. No, we don't want to rebuild our highways, bridges, tunnels, airports, schools, and hospitals with a private-public partnership. It is nothing but crony capitalism, and we don't want to replace TPP with PPP. It's just crony capitalism internalized into the country. As I point out, this would largely be funded and encouraged by tax credits, but also by usage fees such as toll roads. Here in Texas, as I point out, it's gone bankrupt, and they've used this to actually make our transportation system worse by putting restrictions on adjacent roads. We don't want to have that happen. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are still two months away from the inauguration of Donald Trump as the president of the United States. But in a wise move, we're already seeing Donald Trump making hints at administrative selections and at policies that he is going to put into place as we move forward, specifically the big one with immigration. Now, I am not somebody who's been the biggest fan of the wall, but I understand why he talked about it, and I understand the real issue of immigration and border control, but this is what Donald Trump is actually dealing with as far as starting to put some of these into practice. Now, this is from USA Today headline, yes, Donald Trump will have broad power to crack down on immigration. President-elect Donald Trump said he plans to deport about two to three million undocumented immigrants. That's what he said when he was on 60 Minutes on Sunday. He said he would emphasize criminals before deciding about law-abiding families illegally in the country. I think that was a wise move for Donald because a lot of people are afraid that they're in this country, not legally, but that they're going to be deported. But as we've been saying, you know, the first people Donald Trump is going to look at is the criminals he's been talking about. That doesn't mean all illegal immigrants. That doesn't mean Mexicans. That's just the criminals who have been deported and then come back and then come back to this country. We've seen it multiple times. He wants to focus on those people. Now, here's an interesting chart that shows the returns and the removals of people. This is from the same USA Today article. And you'll notice that the returns have been going down ever since Obama came into office. Obviously, we can understand why. The returns are people who try to enter the US illegally that get stopped at the border and then shipped back. This is something we did not see coming from Barack Obama. ICE even admitted this. When we talked to Border Control, they also said that this was an issue where they can't even enforce the law. But the interesting thing is we're seeing that removals are actually on the way up. I think that's because there's been so many people that have come to this country illegally that, of course, removals is going to go up when you have such a increasing number of the illegals here. You're going to see the removals go up. But it's amazing how the returns went just straight down under Obama. I wonder what that graph will look like after four years 
of a Donald Trump administration. Now, this is the key point here, folks, when it comes to refugees. The number of refugees accepted by the U.S. each year is set exclusively by the president. So this is something that Donald Trump will have power over, just like President Obama increased the number of refugees accepted into this country to 70,000 in 2015. And then in 2017, Barack Obama made that number 110,000. So in the first year of Trump's administration, he's going to, I suppose, be dealing with that Obama number of 110,000. We'll see if there's anything he wants to try to do about that or if there's anything he can do about that and then what the number for 2018 might look like. Now, the border wall. Extending the 650 miles of wall or fencing that currently exists would require congressional approval because of the billions of dollars that the project would cost. Of course, Trump says Mexico will pay for it. Trump sold six, told 60 Minutes that in certain areas a wall is more appropriate, but in other areas there could be some fencing. So perhaps Trump is, is kind of backing down off of the build the biggest wall in the history of mankind across the whole border um, rhetoric that some people believe was coming from him. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican out of Kentucky, said on Wednesday that border security Security is something he thinks ought to be high on the list. But wait a second, Mitch, you've been in government. You've had a very powerful spot in government for a long time. How come it wasn't a high priority under the Obama administration? So not sure about Mitch McConnell and his comments there. Let's see how long he lasts um, now that Donald Trump has come or will be coming into the White House and that the American people are more aware of who they're voting for. I think that that might be a death blow to Mitch McConnell. Now, this coming out of Life Zet, agents brace for pre-Trump border surge. Now, of course, we've already seen this happening with people coming to the border, knowing that Donald Trump is about to get elected. They've actually been warned in foreign countries to come to this country because Trump's going to get elected. This is their last chance to get in here for free, basically, uh, evade the law. At the same time, according to the head of the union representing over um, 16,000 U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agents, career level managers of the agency are likely to push back against the directives of outgoing political appointees of Obama. Now, actually, I want to correct myself. I'm not sure if this is 165,000 or 16,000, maybe a typo here on the article. Uh, but nonetheless, they're talking about how they don't want to listen to what Obama appointees are saying about Border Patrol, and they're more interested in hearing what Trump has to say or catering to Trump's policies. You can expect to see CBP pushing back and holding those people um, talking about who Obama is appointing, they're going to want to make it look like we're in lockstep with Trump. We're already seeing it now. So as we've said, this is another example of Donald Trump already being the United States president, where the people in charge of the border are more catering to his policies than Obama's. Um, now, Brandon Judd went on to say, you're going to see less people giving themselves up. Right now, lots of people cross the border and throw their hands up saying, come get me. Now they're going to try to evade apprehension. Isn't that wild? Most people didn't even think that that was going on, uh, but it was going on, going to the border and running to Border Patrol because you know you're going to get a free handout. Now, here's another thing. Trump may have actually won the popular vote. We're hearing people crying about Hillary winning the popular vote, but voter, uh, votefraud.org has recognized that 3 million votes in this election were cast by illegal citizens. 3 million votes cast by illegal citizens. Um, of course, we're just assuming that those went for Hillary Clinton. We'd have to actually do a little more research to find out if that's true, but I think that's a fair assumption to make. Also, that 4 million dead people were registered to vote the day of the election. So even though Trump won and we're not whining and complaining like the Trump protesters, there needs to be something looked into here with voter fraud. China fires, this is from CNBC, China fires its first warning shot, warning iPhone sales will suffer if Trump starts a trade war. Now, here's the irony of this. Apple iPhones and U.S. goods could suffer sales hit if China... In China, if President elect Donald Trump goes through with his naive, very naive plan of slapping a large import tariff on Chinese products. Aw, so you mean that your slave goods aren't going to sell as well in the United States? The super rich aren't going to profit as much off of slave labor? Now, the funny thing is the liberals are going to use this against Trump. Ignore the tactic, tactics that are used by these manufacturers to... Um, basically drive down the wages of the people building these people, uh, these products, drive down the uh, currency value, 
of the countries where they're being shipped out of in order to make more money for themselves. They'll use that to demonize Trump, but yet they'll go out and they'll buy a new iPhone made by slave labor every year. And of course, what is that iPhone that comes out new every year? It's got a new name and a new upgrade and a new more expensive price made by the exact same slaves that made the same one a year ago, but they're still going to charge you a hand and a leg for that. So I'm sorry, maybe for a year or two, you're going to have to suffer with the same iPhone that you've had for a year, and you're not going to be able to get that most recent iPhone. Isn't that just too bad for you? You can't get the most recent iPhone. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but then what might happen is they might start manufacturing these iPhones in the United States, so more jobs here, and then you know what? Price might actually go down because they don't have to ship those goods over here. They don't have to pay that that import tariff, but that's just how it works. They don't understand that. Soros prepares for Trump war. Now, we're already seeing this, folks. The Democracy Alliance has funneled upwards of $500 million towards liberal activist groups. The DA requires all of its major financiers to donate at least $200,000 a year to approve activist groups. And, of course, what we're seeing now is we have stories, obviously, well, thanks to Project Veritas, we saw what the Democratic operatives do in order to foment uh, unrest on the streets. But now, on Zero Hedge, one of their readers noticed that these protesters are being bussed in. So we've seen it in the WikiLeaks. We've seen it in the Project Veritas. We've been reporting it uh, to you for years on Infowars.com, but now we're actually seeing it manifested. We've actually got the proof. Blocks of anti-Trump protest buses caught on tape. And this person notes who caught the video, a video of five city blocks on the west side of Chicago lined up with buses from Wisconsin. All these people ended up protesting. Of course, we know Chicago is one of their main areas. We heard this um, after Aaron Black, the Democratic operative who you're not supposed to know, admitted they were the ones that shut down the Trump rally in Chicago. Now they're trying to do more of it. Homes vandalized with anti-Trump message. So when they go low, we go to their homes and destruct their property. For more, go to Infowars.com. Welcome back. Tonight, we are here at our roundtable to break down for you exactly what is happening out there in the world. Uh, you are witnessing community organizers doing their very, very best to try and nullify President-elect Donald Trump. It is, it is no coincidence that these protests were ready to go across the country um, immediately following the, this announcement that he would be the 45th president. Um, so these are Alinskyite tactics. Now, who is Saul Alinsky? We've t told you about him a lot. He wrote the book on community organizing. He's considered to be the guru of community organizers. Uh, President Obama is a famous community organizer. And uh, Hillary Clinton actually wrote her college thesis on Saul Alinsky's tactics as well. Um, this is Alinsky who dedicated his book, Rules for Radicals, to Lucifer, who he considered to be the original radical who you know overthrew a kingdom or rebelled and got a, a whole entire kingdom to himself so a lot of internet trolls like to uh, use alinsky's tactics as well so this is very important that mm -hmm. we break these down see how the left is using these tools they've been using them for decades and we probably didn't even realize it you have to understand the tactics that your enemy is using mm -hmm. so let's go ahead and uh, get into these rules for radicals so we can expose and neutralize so first rule Power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. Yeah, and it also goes on. It says power is derived from two main sources, money and people. Have nots must build power from flesh and blood. And I think that this can be illustrated in the sense where what we're seeing here is it's well known now that George Soros and the Democratic Initiative is to fund these protests. They're bringing in hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars to fund this stuff. And now we're seeing it in the streets. People are getting bust in. So what you have here is the power being derived from the people that have the money. And then the have nots, which are the people that don't have the money, are the ones that are the flesh and blood out on the streets actually fighting for the people who have the money and the power's cause. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're seeing here with rule number one. And like you said, Leanne, these are tactics that have been used for a long time, but now we're starting to exemplify them, uh, illustrate them, and see examples of them in the streets. Right, absolutely. And of course, I know with the media, for example, uh, using the polls to kind of say, you have no chance, you have mm -hmm. no choice, using the media to say, you know, we have all the power, Trump, you're going to lose. 
Um, so we'll just kind of quickly roll through these. So the second rule, never go outside the experience of your people. Perfect example of this. Uh, over the weekend, there, uh, Fox News had a bunch of interviews with some of these protesters, and they were saying, you know, why are you protesting? And they would just kind of stare blankly. They were out of their comfort zone. I have no idea. Exactly. Would, uh, but Trump is a racist, sexist, homophobe. So you don't want your people that you're organizing, you don't want them to go talk to the media and get in front of a camera and try to explain why they are out there protesting, because that's not their job. Their mm -hmm. job is to just go create a commotion. So, you know, there's a second rule, which their people fail. This and that's weekend. why they won't answer questions, too. Right. They're because they can't. Of their influence. They actually cannot. I don't know if you guys saw this video really quickly, but they, they were struggling to even come up with one reason why they dislike Trump. It was like they couldn't do it. It was it was or at least an original thought, something right. that wasn't just hearsay. Well, what did he say that was racist? Well, I don't know, but he it doesn't matter. He's just a racist, sex, homophobe. So those are perfect examples. Okay, so uh, three, whenever possible, go outside of the experience of the enemy. So uh, this is, a, you know, something like the enemy would be forced to address irrelevant issues. Perfect example is when they came after Trump uh, about the bathroom bill, but then they couldn't roll with that one because he didn't give them the answer that they were expecting. He was like, I don't care. Caitlyn Jenner can use my bathroom, whatever. So there they kind of, that story died, dead in the water. No one remembers Trump wants Caitlyn Jenner to use his bathroom, whatever. Okay, so number four, make the enemy live up to their own set of rules. So if the rule is that every letter gets a reply, you make them write 30,000 reply letters and basically you swamp their resources. Their credibility is at stake here. And we've seen this tactic used a lot uh, against Christians. Mm -hmm. So they'll say, well, Jesus wouldn't do that. What would Jesus do? And so you kind of put mm -hmm. them to where they have to explain their actions based on their own rule book. Mm -hmm. um, five, I know... Uh, Margaret, you said we could all kind of talk for hours about this right. one. Ridicule is oh man's gosh. most potent weapon. And we've been seeing this again and again for the last year and a, ha a half. Constant ridicule of both Trump and his supporters. It's unbelievable. So you you womanize her, you racist. It's over and over and over. And it, they've done a, such a successful job of beating this into their SJW warriors. And, you know, that brainwashing tactic of ridicule. Ridicule has been really powerful. You know, this is something innately we understand as humans from the time we're three years old. Uh, we learn it on the playground, but you you never see that evolve because ridicule in its most basic form is very preschool-like. So they're taking a preschool tactic and it's not even developed <laughs> as an adult. You right. just keep going with the ridicule. It's it's or we have and they very, basic. very childish. We too. also have a right. video up right now about all the people who were laughing at Trump, saying you're never going to be president. Obama going out on the on the uh, talk shows or the comedy shows and saying you know you're not going to be president. Everyone laughs uproariously. John Oliver, I dare you, Donald. Yeah. I dare. Dare you to run for president? I dare you. <laughs> or Hillary Be careful Clinton, what you wish for. Hillary Clinton coming out and making a big joke of uh, Trump's remarks at the debate, how he wasn't sure he would have to see if That's he right. would agree to the peaceful transition of power. And now look at them. Not only that, <laughs> but we, we have an article. Um, it's from the New York Times where literally Stephen Bannon, so they've already won the election. He's already been appointed the chief strategist. He's the chief swamp drainer on his Twitter. And yet the only thing they can come up with is racist white supremacist. That's literally the title. And it's getting old. It's getting old. So, and then that kind of goes on to uh, the next one. A good tactic is one that your people enjoy. You don't want to get people bored with this protesting, um, you know, yelling, trolling, breaking stuff. Everybody loves that. Well, so, and, and here's what you, here's what you got. So you got to pay for the people, you know, to perhaps travel to a different city <laughs> or, you know, go out of their way to be get a part them out of, of their the, exams. To people be a enjoy part of the larger protests, right, where they have the numbers. But the point here is to get them doing something they enjoy. They don't have to pay these high school students to go out and beat up Trump supporters. They genuinely like doing that. This, right. You know, they wanted to beat someone up. Now they think there's a political point behind it and they're justified by the mainstream news in Obama. They go out and do it. Homes vandalized with anti-Trump messages. Again, these for whatever reason, you know, you can get to the psychology of this, but Nobody had to pay them to go vandalize these homes. Nobody probably asked them to go vandalize these homes. They felt that it's, be, you know, obviously Trump. I mean, he's the biggest racist ever. He's a bigot, so they have to do something about it. So what did they do? They did something they enjoyed. They enjoy going out and vandalizing. They enjoy going out and destroying property. That's their psychology. So, of course, right. these are the people that the Democrats have catered to, and we know that this is going on. Right, and but then so that kind of ties into the next one, uh, a tactic that drags on too long becomes a drag. So you don't want to occupy movement. Perfect example of this. They were out there for such a long time that it kind of lost its its uh, intensity, um, reusing the same argument again and again or the same name calling racist, sexist, homophobic. It's losing its power. 
Uh, rule number eight. I'm sorry, Margaret, did you want to? No, no, no. I was just going to say back to the point of uh, you enjoy it. Do something that everyone enjoys. Well, of course you enjoy it as long as it's not your home or unless it's not you getting the right. crap kicked it's out. It's not your city. It's selective enjoyment only. It's, yeah. it's enjoyment for the bad guys, if you will. The, the innocent being preyed upon. That's not enjoyable for you at all. Let me just stress that. <laughs> so <laughs> not Thank universally you enjoy. I did not enjoy Rule number that. eight, keep the pressure on with different tactics and actions. Utilize all events of the period for your purpose. Of course, we can see uh, at these protests, they've got all the movements all rolled into one. The Black Lives Matter, LGBT, feminism, Palestine. It's like all the present day things. We just we're, we're all going to fight you all at once. And it's funded by the same people, which brings us back to rule number one, George Soros. Yes, Soros riots. Uh, rule number nine, the threat is usually more terrifying than the thing itself. Okay, Trump is literally Hitler. He's going to gas all the disabled people and deport your families. He's literally, um, so here, it's like mm -hmm. simmer down. Obviously, the thing itself is not that terrifying. Ten, but which is why they get justified to do it. Yeah. Okay. As if it's really that bad. Go ahead, Leanne. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to speed through these. 10, maintain a constant pressure upon the opposition. Never let up. And of course, we saw that we they gave us zero time to celebrate this victory. They rolled out these mm -hmm. protests across the nation like that. So you constant pressure, never letting up. 11, if you push a negative hard enough, it will break through into the counter side. Um, perfect example, they were sending out agitprop protesters mm -hmm. to the Trump rallies, specifically targeting, as we learned through Project Veritas, specifically targeting people that they were thought were like mentally ill, that they knew they could rile up. So that they would get beat up and then they would run to the media and try to gain sympathy and say, see how awful Trump supporters are. Um, so there's that one. Twelve, the price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative. You know, they're not doing these protests for nothing. They want to they they have the alternative. Their compromise is going to be a win. And then 13, pick the target, freeze it, personalize it and polarize it. And this one has been the most damaging. They've really attacked Trump personally, he's racist, sex, homo, try to ruin his brand entirely. We'll be talking more about this all week. Sorry, our time is up. Thank you so much for watching the show tonight, and we will see you here tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.